yeah, I, ju I just think it's really special to be here, be in community, practicing in community. And as always, I just really appreciate everybody showing up and being here online and in person. It really, truly makes such a difference, every single person. Um, and I just always look forward to Wednesday nights and just to have this time in community and also to like welcome new folks as well as see a lot of familiar faces. I do think building community, especially values-based community, um, that is the revolution. That is the kind of radical change we need in the world. So just grateful to be here with you all. And I'm Eve, and this evening we are going to, we're getting close, y'all, to the end of this book. I know. But I will say, uh, sneak preview and spoiler alert, on June 12th, uh, Alejandro Chaul, who is one of Wangyal Rinpoche's senior students, will be here, and he'll be guiding a Tibetan yoga practice. Okay. So it's using this approach to the elements but through breath and movement, just is like amazing practice of calling in every element. And um, so we won't totally leave the wonderful teachings of this book, which invite us so simply and so profoundly to reconnect to our true essence through connection with the natural world. It's just so beautiful. And <clears throat> I think I know what we're gonna read next together. I checked in with Mace about this. I think she's the only one in the room who was here last time. I'm the only one, there's no way. I think so. Anyone else here when we did the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life? Okay. <laughs> Are you ready to, to, to return? Because it's such a, last week we started our practice, which I would like to do again, with a deep focus on bodhicitta, mm -hmm. the heart of awakening, which is just so fundamental to our, it is the fruition of practice. It is the path of practice. It's, you know, it is so essential. And that text, uh, maybe you've even heard of it if you've never read it, just such a fundamental text. And the original is a eighth century master named Shantideva, Interesting story. We'll get into him. But I use a secondary text that was written by Pema Chodron. So it's really like so heartfelt and wise as she is taking this ancient text and kind of bringing it to life. So we'll probably start that in a, in a couple weeks as we wind down. Um, but before we wind down, we're going to, yes, no problem, find space. And um <clears throat> We're going to revisit the Three Precious Pills again in practice. We're going to re-engage with our bodhicitta. I love us to kind of really have that in heart-mind. And I also just want to emphasize, coming off a weekend teaching with my dear friend, uh, Ryan Redman, he kind of channels just this love of attention and cultivating attention and the unbelievable, incomparable benefit of cultivating our attention and want to highlight that when we do these practices of the three precious pills, so inviting in that stillness, the silence and the warmth, we're practicing shamatha, we're practicing attention. And that is like, we can't get far. Even though bodhicitta, as I said, is the fruition, it's the path, it's probably the engine as well. Like it's really the entire piece, we can't get very far in any of our practices if we don't have the capacity to bring our attention back and bring our attention back and even start to stabilize our attention moment to moment. I am not sure if we have ever lived in a time when that was harder. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been hard, but I think we're really working against the stream. And one thing that's interesting is in the practice tonight, I'd, I'd like us to bring a feeling that is difficult and hold it with these three precious pills. It's where we are in the book when he helps us understand the relationship of loneliness and relationship in the context of really bringing into spacious awareness and silence and warmth. I think our distraction makes us feel more lonely it kind of makes and perpetuates that sense and delusion of separateness. So I'm telling you now, so you can kind of get a moment to just reflect on a time that you felt lonely recently. Because even though 
I think the loneliness is a delusion. We're not alone. It feels pretty goddamn real a lot of the time. And it's really painful. And it's really hard to practice when we don't have a sense of connection and warmth and safety. So to bring that loneliness to the practice, I think is a really um, beautiful offering that he lays out in this book. So to get us started, I wanna just say a couple words on, um, on Bodhicitta. So I mentioned last week that Bodhicitta is not, it's not just a feeling and it's not just a thought. It is something we, we start to feel as like a very alive part of our mind and heart. Like it becomes a way to channel our yearning and longing for the world to be safe, for the world to be just, for the world to be the one we want to live in and to have that yearning and that care. And instead of it leading to bitterness or pain for that, to be able to have that sense of, may I liberate myself for the sake of all beings Mm -hmm. like this is so needed. And as I mentioned, it's really interesting when you think of the relative bodhicitta. So our day to day of the kindness we can offer to people, the way we can slow down and be more present is so much kindness. The relative everyday bodhicitta is so important. But that ultimate bodhicitta is our glimpse of pure rigpa. Like it is not as though when we have kind of the highest state of bodhicitta, all we're doing is thinking about loving and thinking about caring. It just permeates the entire field of awareness. There's no separateness whatsoever. And I find that so inspiring. So I just wanted to share that with you all. So we will go ahead, get started here in our practice. So finding a a comfortable position for your practice. If folks want, there is definitely space here on the floor. And taking a moment before we even settle into our posture to take in the room around us, take in the beings around us, both for he- folks who are here and at home, giving ourselves a little bit of those visual cues. Of, okay, here I am, got Sarana at the door, protecting us, we're safe in the room. Just kind of feeling that sense of being held. And for everyone in the room, not everybody here is familiar. And so just kind of feeling that sense of sitting in community, and a little bit of the uncertainty that brings, but also the opportunity for connection that that offers. And finding the simple points of posture that can really help us show up more fully in our meditation. For those sitting, feeling the feet evenly planted on the floor, Finding a sense of an upright spine. And it might be interesting to experiment. So just leaning back and forward and really finding where the spine has that sense of a natural uprightness, a dignity, as though we're sitting on the throne of our meditation. This upright spine should help us feel a vividness, a kind of clarity and joy coming into our practice. Soften through all the muscles in the face. Soften through the heart and the belly.
find a place where the hands feel at ease and balanced, whether resting on the thighs or folded in the lap. And be intentional about every part of the posture, the softness of the eyes and jaw, the brightness and vividness of the spine and the solidity of how the hands and feet are supporting the entire posture. as a way to enter the practice. Engage with this aspiration of bodhicitta, finding the place in you that so desires living in a world where there is less suffering. Of course, there's still pain, but because all beings could be awake, they could be alleviated from unnecessary suffering. Just feel the yearning of the heart for that to be true. A whole world where beings experience less suffering. And whether this feels like heartache or fire, resignation or worry, use whatever energy arises to dedicate this practice. Doing this work of training heart and mind to wake up for the sake of each and every being, all beings of all times, all beings of all worlds. With this sobering and heartfelt dedication, now we enter our practice more fully, knowing the value and importance and what we do it for. Find the stillness of the body. As we settle the body in its natural state of stillness, we may experience a settling of energies alongside an upwelling of energies, ideally a little bit less centered and focused on thinking and thoughts, and more present with the entire experience of a body in this moment, in this breath, and its ability and capacity to feel like a refuge of stillness.
every time the mind gets busy, distracted, carried away. Just be kind and gentle with yourself. Relax, release, and return, refreshing your interest and further settling into the stillness of the body, body like a mountain. And it's not enough to just imagine stillness. We really have to enter stillness in the body for it to become a sense of refuge. As everything in the world can be moving around us, we can pause and pour all our attention and awareness to this body. and find stability and stillness amid all the movement of sensations and subtle energy. As we settle, even breath by breath, having a couple moments where we're fully in the body, we may start to notice or be aware of some sense of inner light. So the stillness of the body as an unbounded sacred space gives rise to seeing, feeling, being the luminous nature that's inside of us. We settle the speech naturally, choosing and preferring the inner silence. And doing so by following the breath a bit more closely, you know, being with the body and inviting the silence by noticing the subtleness of the inhale the subtleness of the exhale. Here, we want our attention to be just tight enough, not too tight. So a little bit of looseness, just like that perfect guitar string, tight with a bit of discipline to keep our mind and keep returning our mind to following the breath and fully inhabiting the body with our attention and awareness. We're not feeling rigid, not feeling too tight as though we are contracting or clenching in any way. So find this balance of softness and brightness and continue following the breath, settling the inner speech to silence.
keep returning, keep returning with kindness, with grace. And as we continue to cultivate these inner refuges, this unbounded sacred space of the body, this luminous light of our awareness, we can then focus our attention and awareness at the heart. Feel the warmth and space and openness of the heart-mind. This could feel like leaning back in the mind. A little bit more space and openness as the energy of thoughts arise. Just finding and seeing and experiencing the space that permeates them, that is all around them. And then like the wave returning to the ocean Allow the thought to just return back into awareness and once again become the ocean. Now feeling the intermingling of these three precious pills, these doorways to our inner refuge. Feeling the body settled. The inner speech settled. And the mind settled or settling. Feel and imagine this as a cultivation of a space of care and love and kindness within us. We could almost feel as though we were being held in this spacious warmth of the settled body, speech, and mind. And here, in this place of being held or even cradled, 
what's in our innate spaciousness and warm. We can bring to mind an area in our life where we feel a loss of connection, that sense of loneliness. Maybe there's a mental image or a specific story. And just allowing ourselves to feel the, the pain and the difficulty of that. And then without trying to change this feeling, experience it as being hosted in a larger sense of unbounded sacred space and warmth. No feeling and seeing and being with the loneliness, the loss of connection while feeling the presence of stillness and silence and warmth. And without an agenda or expectation, just Continue holding both the greater space and body of warmth, openness, and this feeling of loss of connection. While the mind may still meet, be busy, consider the possibility that there is actually nowhere else to go. Being <clears throat> right here with this discomfort and disconnection is exactly where we need to be. Keep coming back and refreshing, healing the whole body and its undulations of energy. <laughs> Inviting and turning towards inner silence and opening and opening and opening with warmth.
Notice how does the loneliness feel? So much of the busyness and activity of this monkey mind is preparing or avoiding or ameliorating, just being with this existential or ontological loneliness. And what if we can just be here with it fully? Nowhere to go, nothing to do. Just holding it in warmth, and openness, spaciousness. For those of us here in the center, allowing all the sounds and distractions to act as reminders to come back and find this true inner refuge. Returning to regather more of our attention, the breath. And again, finding this beautiful mixture of discipline and ease. And following the full course of breath. Through the entire rise and fall. Whatever degree of presence, awareness is really manifest in the body, heart, and mind. See if you can sustain this. Maintain yourself here, even as the bell rings. And we shift and transition our attention and awareness to the rest of the room.
Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> so it would be wonderful to hear from anyone questions or reflections on that practice. Some folks here are now months in working with these precious pills. So wonderful to hear how that's going, evolving, devolving, no problem. Yeah, Cage, thanks so much. And yeah, for folks in the room, please using the mic. Oh. And that was really wonderful, thank you. Mm. Uh, I, I guess I have a couple of things. The three pills are great. I have worked with them a little bit now and I really love them. Um, I feel like I didn't start reading the book until like right before Tenzin came and mm. I have a better sense of them. Um, but I guess speaking of attention, if you had like three, I don't know if it, it seemed really loud. <laughs> it was, that was one of the louder sits. So was it one of the louder ones? Anyway, I was like. <laughs> yeah, there is, right? What? That weird, like, giant. Yeah. Oh. There, there, there have been several. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been here for a while, so I was like, what, is it yeah. always this loud in this seat, or is it a new place? Um, but my attention, it really was like, wow, my attention is really pretty devolving, yeah. maybe. Um, so if you had any, like, top recommendations to up your attention. During practice or in general, or both? Both. Okay. Oh. Yeah, uh, it is really hard with sound. Like we don't choose to listen, right? We just receive sound. And um, there is this wonderful study um, that was done with Mechi Ricard, who I brought up before. We read his book two years ago now, a year ago, can't remember. Yeah, yesterday. Um, and he, you know, he has unbelievable amount of hours in, in sustained practice and has uh, kind of allowed himself to be a guinea pig in a lot of early neuroscience studies of compassion. And one of the studies that was done is asking him to be really deep in a compassion practice and then sounding a very lar loud siren next to his ear. <laughs> psychology Whoa. so cool <laughs> um he you know he agreed to do it because they were interested in could that level of deep focus override the startle response mm -hmm. yes we are not at you ricard and i think it's it's always encouraging when you have these like olympians of attention and compassion to look mm -hmm. towards and be like Okay, because I think a little bit of it with the sound, it's not just the sound, it's I don't want that sound, you know? And so being, right? And so with the startle, it's like his focus is so deeply on compassion for others that he, like the sound, it's like whatever, it's just sound. It's like he can experience the emptiness of sound through his compassion. For sure. I think it's hard. And, I, and so I'm saying both like it's really hard with sound or if like, you know, all of a sudden big cookie smell came in here, we'd be like, you know, where are the cookies? <laughs> like it's all of our sense portals. There's so much. And with that, with the baked cookie smell, at least for me, it would be like so much desire. Like, where are those? Are there going to be any left over? Right? Like, so we just think <laughs> it's not just the sensory input. It is like how we are adhering to it. And I was like, also, I was like, when do they play music up here? They've never played music up here. Right. And so I was, I was like indulging in the sound because I was letting, like I could see that. I was like, hey, come back, come back. So I think there, I think it is interesting um, to like challenge ourselves a little of like, I can't. Um, I might've said this before, but when I did this, incredibly hard month in Burma of Vipassana practice. I was like, oh, it'll be so remote in this beautiful hillside temple. Um, it was so loud, so loud. Like all day, all the boats on the river were blaring music, like just like, and, you know, and I stopped hearing it, you know, because we were practicing 16 hours a day or something insane. 
-hmm. and you do like you realize like oh that is just sound and it does like kind of change and focused attention is like really profound you know the same as when we're doing something we really love and someone's been calling our name or like oh so like we can actually and i think it's good to know that we can because that gives us a little more like discipline we don't let ourselves off the hook so quick of it's loud i can't this i'm not going to do it um and then in terms of developing attention last week we did counting not everybody's favorite but counting is really helpful we did some on retreat you know and that's just that count at the top of the inhale and you exhale up to seven like whatever and you know i, I think i can bring it back here because i am i'm noticing myself the um the difficulty with attention and what an obstacle it is in practice so more and more i'm doing a lot more shamatha because i'm like wow i'm just and and the precious pills are shamatha but it can get a little diffused because it's not like a really good shamatha or attention training object is like right there in front of you um, which could be looking at a candle flame it could be focusing on the breath it could be looking at a sacred object it's just like one area of it, it could be sound um, and so i think but counting is you know using our thoughts to help us focus and then labeling is another that we can do so the thought arises and it's like you know planning dinner dinner you know like whatever <laughs> yeah dessert you know giving ourselves like using our thought you know, losing our ability to think in order to harness the mind. Um, so those are other ways. Compassion practice is an attention practice. Okay. And I really, really think um, this is not only advice you see in uh, traditional Tibetan texts, but you've now seen research coming out of the University of Wisconsin on this, many moments of awareness throughout the day, often just as good as a longer practice. So you have like five minutes between stuff and you know what you don't do? <laughs> like you just are like, what's happening through all my senses for five, two minutes. It can recalibrate and it makes a huge difference. When I really, and this is, I'm gonna say it again. I don't love the word, but when I'm really disciplined to myself of like, you are gonna take those moments of awareness in like a week, I notice a huge difference. So I just invite you to experiment for yourself of like, okay, discipline, like, cause I, I don't love the word discipline, but man, we need it. We are all so just like twizzled out on our, on our stimulus and like stimulations, you know? Yes, yes, it's a good word. So I do like, we just, it needs, we need to kind of be like, hey, like we need to be that fierce compassion, like, hey, cut it out put it down, just be here. Like really, really, really need it. And again, it's so interesting how our lack of attention contributes to so many poor mental health yeah. outcomes. Yeah. You know, it's not just do it because it's, you need to be a Jedi mind train. It's like, it's in order for us to really be present with what's happening, which is usually a better place to be than the catastrophizing and the ruminating and the distraction. Yeah, I think I got things. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or reflections? Friends online? Great. Yes. Um, just carrying on from that conversation about um sound and getting distracted i'm kind of confused about um on the one hand um i can follow the sound and be with the sound and just hear it and let it in let it do its stuff and on the other hand i can also shut it out mm. but i i i'm confused because it's not just hearing the sound and not having not reacting to it but just hearing it is that not paying attention whereas cutting it out is not not paying it's <laughs> not paying attention yeah yeah, yeah. so 
should I mean the should you know part shouldn't I be paying attention to the sound in a way because it's part of the whole experience? Great question. Um, it depends on the practice. So if we're doing mindfulness of sound, we wouldn't want to shut it out, but we would want to not get into the yeah, like what the hell is that undulating noise up here? And like, why are they playing a record? Like we would just receive the sound and the sound is our object. But if we're not focusing on sound as much as possible, we would like to redirect away and, and maybe not hear it. Though that is so hard. You know, there's that level of absorption and practice where you are so situated and settled in the presence of your practice like it's you know you just feel internally very organized around your practice maybe some of you have had a glimpse or longer period of that and like nothing outside of the practice is compelling at all and that's really then it's kind of like choiceless it's not like oh i shouldn't listen to the sound it's like this is every like this you know, being with in the present moment, your experience and process and unfolding is just ultimately very compelling. <laughs> yeah. And I think hopefully that we get little glimpses of that now and then, but a lot of it is more like, you know, the, that kind of um, analogy of hurting the puppy back over and over. Um, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Do you guys think it's loud now? You should come in the mornings when everybody's getting ready upstairs or oh, whatever wow. they're doing. Um, I think I have a hard time when I actually can be in my body and focused on my breath and I'm like coming to a nonverbal place and like I'm feeling my body buzz and I'm just feeling really good. And then like you talk and the teaching comes and I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no I don't, I don't care about that. This is the best. Yeah. And so I tried to like get into it. I'm like, okay, I'm here. I can do this at home. I'm here to hear what's going on tonight. And um, it's like so uncomfortable. And maybe it's because it's an uncomfortable subject matter. Mm. Um, but I was thinking about, I started thinking about, I'm like, I don't want to think about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm lonely at work. Mm. And I think that is the crux of like the issues that I have at work, mm -hmm. which is like when stuff, ha I'm very isolated and when stuff happens, I don't have anyone to turn around and talk to. Mm -hmm. So I end up like freaking out, <laughs> um, freaking out, you know, having regrettable emotional episodes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a good look. <laughs> and so like, if I can be more, if I can feel more, what was like the warmth, the openness yeah. and whatever. So I started to picture it myself at work and I'm like, God damn it, this is my week off. I do not want to be doing that. I want to picture myself at work and not at work. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I'm just wondering if you have anything uh, around like when I am in a rare place where I can actually be in the moment and in my body and then it's like, yeah. Like, do I deny the thing I'm being prompted to do or, yeah, you know, yeah. Good. Two good questions there. I think, um, yeah, it's really, it's really tricky, um, with guided practice. It can really be a meaningful scaffolding and it's like just enough and then we can coast. And then sometimes it's just annoying. <laughs> the timing's off and we're like, no, I was like in my thing. So I, I don't think there's a, a good answer for that. Um, I do think, yeah, especially if you're in the place where we're headed, really do not have to follow the instructions, right? Like, cause it's, it's always just kind of an offering, you know, like, is this, um, is this going to be useful? Is this going to be helpful? And where you are is 
not ruminating or catastrophizing, but actually present with your body. Say, so just hang. I do think it's interesting though that, you know, um, you did try out the loneliness and it did come up at work and that was palpable. And I, I do find, I was doing this practice um, yesterday and this morning of bringing loneliness and then bringing the spaciousness and it really helped. <laughs> and for me, the loneliness really comes like beginning of the day, middle of the day, I'm like, whatever, whatever. But towards the end of the day, that's when I start to feel that. And sometimes it's actual alone. Sometimes it's more that like existential alone, you know, that bigger aloneness. And finding space to host it in the warmth and in the openness and the and the silence was really beautiful. I understand not wanting to bring to mind work or difficult experiences. And he does recommend, I'll, I'll share some of his words. He does recommend doing it like in the moment, you know, when you're feeling it. And again, um, you know, like as you're reaching for the device to like not feel lonely, like taking that moment and maybe practicing of silence, stillness, warmth. And even if you still pick it up, there's a little bit less maybe of that, um, you know, getting lost into, you know, according to Rinpoche, there's no reason for loneliness ever. If you are truly released from the pain body and resourcing from the elements. And I find that inspiring. So it's, uh, yeah. And it's really nice to have a colleague at work you can talk to when things are hard. So, you know, there's, there's both. Thank you. Yes, please. So first of all, thank you for that guide meditation. It was really great. Um, I guess I just had a question to kind of pick off on, pick up on the uh, earlier thought about when a sound comes and it's there and you hear it, you know, it's almost like the only thing you can do until you sort of reach that Olympic level is to acknowledge that it's there. Yeah. Right. And then it's almost like if you say no, don't think about that thing, then you're no longer present with what's happening in mm -hmm. that moment. And maybe the goal is to sort of stay in the breath, but you can maybe acknowledge it mm -hmm. and then sort of let it exist in the wings as you sort of bring it back to your breath. You know, until we kind of get to that sort of level where we can't even hear the sound and we're just like focused on whatever it is. Is that all that we can really do? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I, I like what you're saying about the kind of acknowledge and redirect, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a lot of sound tonight, going back to the object of focus, you know, there it is again, going back to the, because it always is coming back, coming back, mm -hmm. coming back until we have, you know, samadhi or some, uh, capacity to just really be in spacious awareness as our established place. Yeah. Uh, so the coming back by naming and recognizing it is great. I think it's a really good strategy. It's a lot like labeling and it could be possible. I almost did in this practice, but I was like, yeah, just kind of going astray. Be like, let's forget the rest of the practice and do mindfulness of, of sound because mm -hmm. that's really what's here. Right. But when you're practicing at home and you're maybe trying to do something else, but it's just like one thing after the other, you can just practice with mindfulness of sound. Because it's really interesting with mindfulness of sound is you feel it in the body. So the different sounds have different imprints in the body. So it's a really kind of rich practice. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, what applies to sound applies to all the senses. You mm -hmm. mentioned with the smell. Yeah. It could be a good smell, it could be a bad smell. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. You know, then say a physical sensation in the body. Yeah. You, or, you know, yeah. what have you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, um, when they did that study with, uh, I think it's Matthew Ricard. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, they played that siren and he, in here, they, how did they know that he didn't hear it? Did you say I didn't hear it? Or oh, no. The, MRI uh, the startle response is a physiological response. I see. Yeah. So they could really measure his body's, you know, like if all of us heard a loud noise, all of us would do this right now. Okay. Like it's a automatic. Um, I see. And he just didn't, he didn't hear it. He right. had less. Okay. There wasn't none, but like almost imperceptible. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. So you can really change that what's probably an, an intuitive natural instinctual response you can yes train that and that's what you know i think in meditation in general 
we never have to think about breathing, right? Unless we have like respiratory illness or asthma, but we never have to think about breathing. Thank God, right? We wouldn't make it. And so then to do this fine-grained awareness of breath is so counter right. to our natural. It like develops this muscle we otherwise would never have. And that's why, you know, it's thought um, we can do these kind of heroic or Olympic yeah, acts incredible. of directing our attention so intently. Yeah. Yeah. And again, for him, it was different when it was just a breath awareness to a compassion meditation. Mm. So the power of bodhicitta, or the power of your intention of care was even an, an accelerant. So he had the sorrow response with breath, but not with compassion or, or lesser. Lesser, exactly. Okay. okay, interesting. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess just maybe last question slash yeah, sure. comment. Um, you know, so you mentioned sort of an aversion to the, the, the idea, the word discipline. And I always think about discipline as, as sort of driving from the word disciple mm. to be a student of. And I thought, you know, when you're a disciple of your time, you'll have more of it. When you're a disciple of money, you'll have more of it. Yeah. So, so you know, I know there's sort of that, you know, corporal punishment type type, type <laughs> definition, but that's how one one way that I kind of put that in. So just, just a thought there. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And I, you know, again, I just, I think it's very close to fierce compassion. Mm -hmm. for oneself right there's that discipline right right like i want what's best for myself so i can be of service to all beings so i kind of got to pull it together right <laughs> you know i gotta i actually got effort right right, right, right right um but we have so much wrong effort in our you know a lot of modern culture of just like driving ourselves so hard doing so much maximizing yeah. it really has to have that um that joy so the kind of joyful enthusiasm vidya this quality of really being in our practice because we love it like i think if that is with the discipline then we're in a really good place awesome thank you yeah thanks wonderful questions and reflections anybody anybody else sweet all right i want to share a little um from rinpoche here <laughs> he has these two chapters, um, one on relationship and one on loneliness, but they're kind of the same chapter, I realize. I've looked at them a couple different times. And, you know, what he says on relationship is is pretty intuitive, but it's, it's worth revisiting uh, these kind of eternal truths where this idea of, like, how do we support others with the three precious pills? by supporting ourselves with <laughs> three precious pills, right? We actually can show up more fully, be more available when we can create that as like an energy around us. It's really, you know, interesting as a uh, recovering passive aggressive person. Um, I'm, I'm onto it. I'm moving towards liberation. You know, it's like the worst strategy because like you think nobody notices you're upset you're like i'm holding it in because i'm so much more superior or like whatever <laughs> i don't even know what the thought is but like everybody around you for like a mile radius can feel that you're pissed you know so that's the opposite of like stillness <laughs> silence and warmth and you're radiating it right and you're like no i'm good <laughs> right and so how do you like bring that different quality and and he describes specifically you know working working with difficult emotions and very much very much the same he says um as soon as you begin to feel distress in your body draw your attention to the stillness of your body as soon as your thoughts or words take you away from yourself listen to the silence behind your speech as soon as your mind starts jumping from one imaginary scenario to the next, bring your awareness to your heart and the spaciousness there. So just all these ways that we kind of get uh, hijacked by our emotional experiences. So when you notice the distress of the emotion in your body, the frustration or the loneliness, draw your attention to the stillness that's also there. On the thoughts and words, you know, that inner speech, which is so compulsive. Um, listen to the silence behind that. And when your mind starts jumping all around, all these imaginary things, bring your awareness to the heart and the spaciousness. Just so simple and uh, really beautiful. And he, he also says, 
he thinks kind of in our modern culture, um, I, I don't really like using the term the West and the East. I don't find it actually fits our modern world that well because Singapore and then you got, you know, Brazil and you, I mean, like all around the world, there's all these different um, kind of consciousness going on, but a lot of it that is um, maybe neurotic and difficult and dysfunctional is like the modern. So that's I'll often just switch that out. So he says here in the modern West, mo modern world, I notice many people try to resolve conflicts by expressing their negative emotions outwardly rather than bringing awareness inward to their spacious natures. Um, so for example, when a couple's in conflict, the man may speak from a place of anger and uh, his partner from a place of fear. They are two beautiful human beings with good intentions, but in their anger and fear, they confront and argue each with each other. Expressing these negative emotions doesn't resolve the problem. It is the problem. It's like, it's a little tough here because we don't want to just like suppress our emotions, but this idea that maybe, you know, I'm upset and so I have to show I'm upset or express it or I'm afraid and I need to, like, what is that first move or layer of like attending to oneself with these three precious pills? Again, it's kind of simple, not like he invented these ideas, but I like him inviting us to really look at being with our difficult emotions, being in conflict and using these precious pills kind of as allies. Um, and, and throughout it, he, you know, he comes back over and over to how do we dissolve this pain identity and this pain body? He says, how do we relinquish the false self and the ego? We need to become even more sensitive to our painful reactions to others and bring our attention to them. When we bring clear, open attention, free of judgment our, to our reactions, we become aware of the pain identity. And as we host this pain identity and embrace it with open awareness, it dissolves because we're no longer feeding it with our judgments and pain. Again, nice ideas, very hard in practice when we when we feel that sense of kind of conflict or difficulty um, with a stranger or a loved one or a colleague or somewhere in between. But I love this idea, and, and you kind of see this in some of the ancient ancient texts of when the emotion is strong for a moment, kind of like even let it get stronger so you can see it. Not in a way to express, but like if you're feeling, let's say, um, ashamed or frustrated, really be like, what is this feeling? Like, I really want to feel like, what does this feel like? And especially as he's saying here, bringing, you know, attention to them, but like clear, open attention, not like, let me not feel this. Let me figure out a way to figure out why someone else is wrong. And I'm, you know, a victim or whatever, like getting, that spaciousness around it, um, so hard to do, but very much like this idea um, that came up on the retreat this last weekend of finding the spark before the flame so that we can really have some capacity to work with, especially our difficult emotional reactions. So <clears throat> we're not going to get rid of the spark, like someone, our perceived sense that someone is putting us down or ignoring us or... Um, not liking us the way we like them, that can that can create such, you know, that momentary spark of the emotion can become a flame so quickly when we feed it with our thoughts, with our rumination. So this idea of using the space as a way to kind of help hold it is quite beautiful. Um, and then just say a little bit here on on loneliness. I I just. I think it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty sweet, his, um, his thoughts on loneliness. One moment here. Some of you know our, um, our current Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, who I have brought up a couple times because he, I think, is a living bodhisattva, which is awesome. He seems to have so much care and heart and love, um, which for an elected official, this is like very rare. Um, 
and he's been really emphasizing the epidemic of loneliness in this country, not only among young people, but everyone. And I was looking at the data recently and in the pandemic in North America, the rates were like 25% of people feeling like extremely to significantly lonely in the last day. It's in last spring, like about a year ago, it was down to 17%. That's still like quite a lot of extreme loneliness on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, he really identifies that loneliness is worse than smoking for our health. Mm -hmm. When we don't feel a sense of connection, um, it really actually gets in the way um, of our ability, our body's ability to heal. Um, he doesn't say it that way. That's That's my translation. But, you know, this idea that our body always is looking for homeostasis, our body is a healing body, but when we have this kind of loneliness could be thought of as stress, right? It's this overwhelming feeling of, of sadness. And so that stress takes a huge hit on the body. And he equates a lot of it with technology. And I don't think he's wrong, but I think Rinpoche has a, a bit of a different point of view about what would help because you know it's interesting when you look at the kind of biomedical or modern approach to loneliness it's definitely like be with a lot of people like have a lot of relationships and i like i don't know about you all but sometimes i feel the loneliest with other people you know it's and i do i really do um appreciate the framing of we need to have a sense of interconnection interconnection before we can have interconnection so he says, um, today, millions of people around the world are connected virtually, yet many seem to be more disconnected than ever emotionally and spiritually. We can, living, we can be living with hundreds of people in the same building, walking the same streets, eating the same, in the same neighborhoods, communicating on the same social networks and still feel disconnection. Retrieving your soul starts with finding a deeper connection within from there a deeper connection with others is possible if you engage skillfully in the practices of this book including da, 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 yeah including the ones on loneliness which we did together um, loneliness will no longer remain an issue for you when your soul is healed when all the elements come into balance and you feel whole and connected within yourself you no longer look for others to make you feel complete. And so I don't think he's saying don't spend time with others, right? He loves his family. I see Rinpoche really enjoy talking about his family, being with his family. But that kind of hungry ghost, that sense of always needing more connection, never allowing ourselves to really have like rest, right? One thing after the other, it actually might push us farther away from the connection that we seek. So we can connect with others very well when we have the sense of interconnection. Again, this is kind of obvious, right? Can't love another until you love yourself. But I, I like how he's posing it to us as a challenge to really reconnect with the elements and with nature in order to feel that. Um, yeah, and now time outside is how it's being called or time in sunlight. Also highly associated with improved well-being. So we, that... There is some aspect there of connecting and being in the outside world. Um, but yeah, I'm curious for you all, like what is this idea or how does it land for you that loneliness is actually not being able to connect with ourselves more fully or that loneliness possibly is actually just like a delusion, right? It's not real. It's us not able to see things as they are. Any... Thoughts, objections? Yeah, Jimmy. I'm trying to trying to decide how um, how deep to go into this one right now. Um, four years ago, I went through a really, really difficult um, breakup of a romantic relationship. And um, the circumstances of it 
were were very very difficult, and and there was a lot of pain involved with that, and then the loneliness sort of came mm. after, mm. Um, and I went through a period, though after a while of accepting that I was alone and in in that capacity I was no longer in a partnership, and. Um, and I was okay with that for a while. And then the loneliness sort of got deeper. And I, mm. I realized after a while that I that I wasn't accepting my situation. Mm. I was really resisting it. Mm. And the resistance, all of the strategies that I was going through to try to push that loneliness away, going on dating sites, distracting myself with Netflix, Amazon.com, you know, blah, 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 on and on and on and all, all the storytelling, mm. reading incessantly. Mm. And and then um, it, it really, really fed the loneliness. It made the loneliness more and more acute. And so I started trying to take some action to sort of back away from that and sort of come back in contact with myself and with Sangha, and mm -hmm. that was helpful. But oftentimes, when I feel the loneliness the most acutely is after being here mm -hmm. and going home, mm -hmm. 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, and I'm home, I'm alone. And what I, I you know, for a while, it was just, it was it was very difficult. It was mm. devastating, and um, when we started reading this book, I started doing a practice of instead of chasing it away with reading or watching television or eating at ten <laughs> o'clock at night, which is terrible for me. For everybody, it's terrible for me. Um, I would I would sit. I would light a candle, I would pull out my cushion, and I would sit, mm. and I would feel the loneliness, but it went away. It didn't last very long. It didn't last as long as when I was doing the other strategies of trying to distract myself from it. Yeah. When I would sit with it, it would be there, and it would, you know, and I'd feel it for a while, and it would go away. And it, And in that sense, it did start to become, I started to become aware of the illusion, illusionary aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't real. It was really something mm -hmm. that I was creating more. Yeah, I was alone in that. I wasn't in partnership, but I'm not alone. I have friends. I have family. I have community. And I have really at my best, I have a good connection with myself as mm -hmm. well. Um, so that's been very helpful mm -hmm. is when, and to first identify, when do I feel it the most? Late at night after I've been, maybe after I've been around a bunch of people or, or maybe not, but yeah. usually late at night. Mm. And, in, and instead of rather than, rather than distracting myself from it, okay, yeah. I'm going to sit with it and, and be with it and let it, and, and mm. let myself see that it's gone. Mm. So beautiful. I'd like to kind of prostrate on the floor to that. <laughs> Truly, it's such beautiful, transparent heart, Jimmy, and also just so, um, yeah, so courageous to take it as, as path. And, you know, kind of the only sane thing to do, as you mentioned. Like, it's not just, I'm such a good Buddhist, everything is just emptiness, and I'm... <laughs> Now, right it's like yeah everything everything else doesn't work right all the ways of pushing it away and pushing it away and, and all the fantasies and comparisons of those people are not lonely these people are not you know like this whole thing um of also fabricating not only the separateness but the deficiency 
right? Which can be so easy to do. And I, it is, it reminds me of um, that beautiful Hafez poem, the don't surrender your loneliness so quickly, let it, uh, let it cut more deeply and season your heart as, a, as so few divine or human ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight makes my eyes so soft, my heart so tender, my need for God so absolutely clear. Just that, like our loneliness can be that portal to seeing, um, yeah, like why we need, a gr and like not God that, you know, for Hafiz that has a different meaning, but my need, my need for God, meaning my, my need to feel a sense of more than just this material world and our material presence and other people and things and accumulation. Um, yeah. And it is, it's interesting because it goes a bit in contrast to what the Surgeon General might recommend. <laughs> <laughs> right? He would be like, do your gratitude practice and have your, you know, call someone and do, and that's all good too. But it, it really can, um, it really can't replace just being able to be, to be with and ride that wave of loneliness. Um, and I think it is, I think it's a very natural human feeling. Like I was reading, um, some, and I couldn't find it for tonight, but there's some text, I think it's from Thich Nhat Hanh on the teaching of the Buddha around loneliness and just this, you know, like it's so natural. Like, of course we feel lonely because we're separate from really knowing ourselves deeply like that. There's no way we couldn't feel lonely if we're not able to actually know ourselves at that kind of just intimate level and not like I know all my likes and dislikes and I, I know the things that I enjoy and don't enjoy, but to really know kind of the quality of the heart and mind, which kind of naturally opens up into that sense of universal silence, stillness, warmth. Like it's interesting um, and a bit um, unexpected turning towards and then finding that, there's presence. And I do think, you know, that transition from being with others to being alone can really highlight the loneliness because there is a way that, you know, other people, they can emotionally regulate us. It feels good, right? Like they can help us feel connected. It's not it's such, I don't want to say that all of us should go be hermits in a cave and like full austerities of being alone, but there is, um, I like the idea of just pulling out the cushion and lighting the candle and kind of almost making a date with loneliness, mm -hmm. right? And if it's during the day, then we can bring loneliness to the earth element or the water element um, as well. Thank you. you might have oh, hi, Diane, mm -hmm. please. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you. Wow, this is so helpful. So helpful. Um, um, I've been practicing with... Practicing with are you hearing an echo? Because I kind of am. We don't hear. Okay, echo. good. Okay, um, good. Loneliness is a loneliness big issue with me, just because issue. I have friends. But there, I think part of the COVID thing is people are just in a bubble, and people don't have a lot of time for me. So I can really get behind that with lots of storytelling and practicing with the elements. And I'm so glad that Alejandro is going to come and teach the salon because it's so effing helpful. And then adding it, I added the elements to my practice and getting the healing from the different things. But Rinpoche talks about exhausting, like liberation through exhausting these things by paying attention to them. So when I kind of hit on this insight because he has these three prayers that have to do with the three bodies which I never paid attention to and now I'm all over but they're so helpful <laughs> but my point I guess what I wanted to share was when I notice and remember that I'm a manifestation of the big everything something manifested me as this form and something's gonna manifest me into something else and when I think of that 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 just kind of um centers me and gets mm. me you know to something I really can't even talk about, but, you know, so that's about all I can explain. Thank you. Thank you for your voice. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and I agree, you know, the, the Salung that you're describing, the practice Alejandro will teach the bringing some movement into the body with it, which I think, 
you know, doing again by being in the natural world and like pulling from it and feeling that completeness. And also, you know, it really does feel um, that we actually are a part of everything and made up of everything. And those kind of phrases we say, it's one thing to like see through and recognize, okay, I see samsara. I see that chasing after Netflix and dating apps and ice cream, that's not going to make me feel fulfilled. Okay, good. And then really starting to see and understand emptiness underlying everything. Like, oh, my, my thoughts of being alone are not real. They're thoughts, right? I am okay. I'm just thinking I'm lonely. But to then really feel like you're describing, Diane, that I am part of everything. It's not a It's thought. the fact. It's a fact. Something manifested in me. I can't explain it. And probably many people think they can, but here I am. And I manifested as a little seed and I got, was birthed and I'm here and someday I'm going to pass away and I'll be something else. Cause I guess Einstein said matters, not, you know, created or destroyed. And then it, um, the Buddhist people I train with say no coming, no going, just this, just this. I wrote it on my hand. Cause I've been going through some stuff just to remind myself every single second of it. It's just this. And then when I do that, then I can just see the truth of that storytelling and and disidentifying, but bringing the elements that we learned about in the book to the to lung. So even during the day, I can just, hey, I'm strong. I have some challenges. <laughs> Who doesn't? But just I'm solid. I'm the earth. I'm strong. Or I'm I'm mm -hmm. the fire. I'm powerful. I can get things done. You know, just I'm I'm cleansed with from the water element. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. So, is it your opinion that the epidemic of loneliness is an epidemic of perceived loneliness? It's a very good question. For, for friends online, is, is my opinion that the epidemic of loneliness is perceived versus like real? I do think if we are spending more and more time um, away from other people, there is going to be a sense of, of loneliness. I think also when we're spending our time kind of, again, distracted away from our direct experience that also contributes to loneliness so it is it isn't just the cure to loneliness the exclusive cure to loneliness is cultivating our inner presence that's one piece and then the other is allows us to have authentic relationship with other you know because it's like it'd be like drinking salt water right like you're you don't actually you're not taking the right quantity in so you're not sating yourself if that um, sense of connecting with others isn't coming from a grounded place. I wish Vivek Murthy would hear, he would have loved this conversation. Really beautiful questions uh, and sharing and yeah, just kind of maybe taking a moment and coming back into our breath and our body. <clears throat> and noticing if there's been any stirring of loneliness or just the tenderness of the heart that can feel lonely. And with such great care, not trying to force ourselves, but the kind of compassion we would have if our friend, our close friend said, I feel lonely. Really holding our loneliness with that kind of care. And without as many concepts or words, seeing if we can hold loneliness. And consider setting a prospective intention for the future of meeting, making this warm spaciousness for our loneliness when it arises. Then placing hands together in front of the heart, if that's comfortable, as 
a symbolic gesture of offering kind of reigniting the flame of bodhicitta, what we are here for. Mm. Considering the possibility that our practice could meet support and be of service to all beings. So dedicating our time and energy so that all beings would know their true nature all beings could feel healthy and strong. All beings could experience the true sense of belonging, love, that all beings, each and every being, could be free. Thank you all so much.